Welcome to Long Lost Friends. I'm Elizabeth Eve King. And I'm Andrea Goyen. I'm a painter, performer, writer, Pilates teacher, animal lover, and biologist. Now, I'm a painter, performer, writer, Pilates teacher, animal lover, and uh, okay, I'm not a biologist, but we're, we're long, long lost, lost friends. friends. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we are so excited to be talking to writer Steve Barnes. He's an American science fantasy mystery writer. He's written novels, short fiction, screenplays, scripts for comic books, animation, newspaper copy, magazine articles, and he's been nominated for so many awards, I won't even mention them here. Welcome, Steve. Hey, hey there. How you doing, uh, Andrea? How you doing, Eve? Hi, Stephen. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty, we wanted to do our little pet segment. We understand you have two cats, but they're kind of shy like a lot of cats are. Yeah, I don't see a, I don't, they're, they're not, neither of them is in the cat tree right now. If there was a, one of them was in the cat tree, I could have gone over uh, there. Nah. Okay, so, well, I'll give you our pet fix. Yes, Elizabeth. Here a pigeon. It's actually, it doesn't look like a baby, but it's still growing. It doesn't have all its, its feathers here. And just out of excitement, I will show you how to actually feed a pigeon because their parents provide milk for them, pigeon milk. And they actually have to pry the beak open. Oops, come up here, pigeon, like that. And then they stick their beaks down and put the pigeon milk down. So that's how you have to feed a pigeon if, if you ever want to, which you might not. Where do pigeons get pigeon milk that they're, it's coming out of their mouths? It's interesting, isn't it? It's actually a bit of their stomach lining oh, okay. that sloughs off okay. and it's full of fats and proteins. So it's not really milk, but they call it pigeon milk. Yeah, my yeah. mom used to do that. You know, <laughs> my mom used to do that. My mom is here, have some of my stomach lining. <laughs> That's right. Yum. So Elizabeth. So, what were we going to talk? I mean, we have a, so much to talk about with Stephen. What were we going to start with today? Well, we were going to start talking about how to go from zero to a writing career in just six steps. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, and so here's here's what it is. Step one, and another way to put this would be how to write a book a year with a sentence a day. Okay. So the first step is you commit to writing at least one sentence every day. Period. The reason that you do this is that people cheat themselves by thinking that they have to do some extreme amount of something in order to accomplish anything. Then they know that they're, they're not going to be able to do that. So it's like, I, you know, if I can't write five pages a day or 10 pages a day, I'm not a writer. No, 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 no. If you can do one sentence a day, you can get there because the problem is overcoming the emotional resistance, the inertia. Okay. Once you have, you know, if I was to say, uh, I want to run five miles. That sounds horrible. I wake up in the morning and it's like, oh God, I don't want to do that. But if I say I want to run one lap, that running one lap is enough, then if I get out of bed, brush my teeth, take a shower, put on my sweatsuit, put on my shoes, walk down to the track, stretch, walk around the track one time, if I then know that all I have to do is run, by the time I'm down there at the track and I've done all that other stuff, I might as well run at least a mile. So if all you have to do is a single sentence and you do a sentence and now you've done enough for the day, you will find yourself wanting to do more because now it's, there's no guilt attached to it. There's no fear attached to it. Anything else, the only work is one sentence. The rest is play. You get to play or not. You can do something, but no one doesn't have time to write a single sentence every day. If you do that, you're a writer. You're on the path to being a writer. So that's the first step. The second step is write one to four short stories every month. Short stories are where it's at. Once again, using the writing analogy, nobody trains to run a marathon by running marathons. If you don't run a marathon, if you haven't run around the block, short stories are running around the block. Books are marathons. The number of people who say, well, my ideas come in this size, nonsense. You can write an entire library about a grain of salt, or you can write a two-page short story about World War II, you know, about a German soldier, an American soldier who have to hide in the same, in, in the same foxhole because there was a carpet bombing that went wrong or something like that. Only the treatment of an idea has an intrinsic length. 
the idea itself can be encapsulated in any length. Okay, so the first step is to write at least one short one one sentence a day. The second is to write one to four short stories a month. The third step is to finish what you have written and submit it for publication. Because if you write it and finish it, but don't submit it, that's another form of writer's block. Writer's block is anything that stops you from writing, finishing what you're writing, public, getting what you're writing published, or continually upgrading your performance. Just getting better and better. I don't care about any individual idea you have. I care about the integrity, the overall integrity of your career, your ability to to have a career that is in alignment with your heart, that is taking you as far as your urge to drive yourself will take you. Whatever your innate gifts are, plus whatever gifts you're capable of, of acquiring along the way through gut grindingly hard work and mastery of your fear. So the first three steps, you know, so sending stuff out is critical in terms of being able to deal with the rejection. But when you send something out, you immediately go on to your next work. So by the time it gets rejected, you're halfway through the next work, at least possibly you're two or three stories down the road. So when you get that rejection, it doesn't sting as much. You simply, this is simply what you do. This is chop wood, carry water. This is what you do in order to get where it is you're trying to get to, okay? The fourth step is you don't rewrite except to editorial request. Once you have finished the work, one to four short stories a month, you can spend as long as you want on any one story, as long as you're generating one to four short stories a month. So if I spend five years on a story, that's fine, as long as I'm spending only a couple of days on some other stories, because I've got to get at least one story a month out the door. You don't keep rewriting it infinitely. The process is more important than the product. If you focus on getting a story perfect, you get obsessive compulsive disorder. The story will never be perfect because the more you write, the sharper your perceptions get. So it's like every time you polish a ball bearing, you upgrade the magnification of the lens that you use to look at the ball bearing you just polished. You will never get there. You will always see imperfections. At some point, you have to strengthen the muscle that says, get it out the door, it's close enough. Or else you will literally spend a lifetime polishing a single gym as opposed to having a vast mind where you're constantly bringing stuff up and letting the market decide what's good or isn't good. Your job is just to do your best. Just do your best. However, the other thing that you want is for a professional editor to say yes. There is no compliment for your writing like a check that clears the bank. Like a professional editor who has to bet on you to keep their doors open, to pay their mortgage, to pay their, to put their kids through college. They're looking for writers who they can look at with pride and say, this writer is in our magazine this week, this writer, and, and, and feel they're, they're keeping their job. It's not your parents saying, oh, isn't that cute? It's not, you know, your uncles who throw you a quarter for dancing in the living room when you're a little kid. It's the market saying, I believe that our, our customer base would exchange their money for your dreams. When you hear somebody say that, you're, that's the thing. And so before you get to yes, you will have a, you go through a succession of steps, the form rejection, and then a, a form rejection with a note on it. That's what it used to be. And then a letter. The form rejection with a note on it, like if you were to change this or this about this, we, we might be interested in looking at this again. Pay attention to that. Make the change. Don't hold on to any one work that you've done. Trust the process. You want to get into a dialogue with the editors. Editors, and you see, thing is one of the things that's beautiful about short stories. You don't need an agent to publish a short story. Okay, you you can publish a short story by dealing directly with the editor. But editors, no agents. If you sell several stories to, a, to an editor, that person starts feeling like they know you. They have lunch together with the agents. And if you say, listen, do you know an agent who might be interested in the kind of thing I'm doing and you've made them happy and they've been willing to take several bets on you? They'll say yes. So that's the fourth step is to, is to if you get a dialogue with, an, with, with an, uh, an editor, take it, expand it. So that's four steps. The fifth step is read 10 times as much as you write. Okay. And preferably read at least one level up from what you're writing. In other words, if you want to write 
comic books, read popular fiction. If you want to write popular fiction, read bestsellers. If you want to write bestsellers, read classics. And if you want to write classics, choose your grandparents very carefully. Um, it's, it's input. Output can never exceed input. One of the saddest things is people who say, well, I, you know, I'm a, I don't want to write, I don't want to read because I don't want to be copying other, you know, I don't want to imitate, accidentally imitate Shakespeare or Dickens or who, Sylvia Plath, whoever it is that you love. You learn how to walk and talk and ride a bicycle and everything else by imitation. Imitation is the fastest way to learn anything. Okay, so don't be afraid that you should be reading voraciously, especially when you're trying to get in the field. You should be reading. If, if you want to write a story, a one story a month, you need to be reading at least 10 stories a month. If you want to write four stories a month, one a week, you should be reading at least 40 stories a week. This is the work. This is your job. This is what you do. This is the path. The last thing is you repeat this process 100 times. That when I, when I was about 25, I'd been sending stuff out and not publishing anything. And I was starting to get a little scared. And I looked at the stories told by writers who I admired about how their careers had gone. I realized that on average, they were, they were writing 20, 30 stories before they got published, 40 sometimes. So I said, if I really want to do this, let me give myself some breathing room. I am not even going to ask the question, can I do this until I have run a hundred stories through the process as I understood it at that time. All of the insecurity, all the fear, all that stuff is real and irrelevant. I will not allow the dragons in my head to stop me. I will not allow anything to stop me. And what happened is that by the time I got to story about 23, I was selling. And not a single one of my students who's ever followed this process and made it past story 30 before they published. So there you go. That's it. And what will happen is that if you will continue this process, this cycle covers everything that you need to get published, to publish, to start stair-stepping your way up to longer works, get an agent, do your market research. It's constant. You can't control how the market reacts to you. The only thing you can control is your behaviors and your perceptions. Your, you know, and you, by controlling your perceptions and your behaviors, you can control your emotions. Fear is non-negotiable. Your reaction to the fear is very negotiable. That's fabulous. So if you could give one piece of advice to your younger self, what would it be? Don't be afraid of your fear. I had, I was bullied. I grew up in a world that felt to me like it did not want me here. Um, I was told that it would kill me if I dared to demand to be treated like a human being, that people were not interested in my gifts or my dreams. And I had to, I had to find a way through all that. The most, probably the most, the single most important thing I ever did was insist on balance in my life. But, but I figured that one out. The, the movie, All That Jazz, was a breakthrough for me. But the thing that I did not understand when I was younger that caused me endless grief and pain was the fact that I was afraid of my fear. I thought that my fear meant that I was small or weak or that I could not do the things that I needed to do and wanted to do. Um, no, it just meant that I was afraid. And there were good reasons to be afraid. It was okay. I needed to forgive myself for that. And that took me a very long time. So that would be, that would be the big one. It took me 17 years to earn my first black belt because I was dealing with so much fear. You know, that's no joke. Right. How, well, let's go. Let's I was going to say, sorry for disappearing. I had a computer problem. Oh, I wonder sorry. where you went. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I'm so sorry. I would like to end this section with the best thing you learned this week. Um, you want to start? Thing, okay. The best thing I learned this week is that I need to be more realistic about how far I've come. I've been doing a lot of very specific work for a lot of years. 
And I let my false modesty stop me from realizing the implications of that. I've actually become the person I was trying to be. And the skills that got me here are not the same as the skills I need to either stay here, keep moving forward, or simply to enjoy my life. I'm set up psychologically to struggle, not to enjoy the picnic. Struggling up the hill is one thing, but being able to just kind of relax and be with my friends and family and say, look at this view, isn't this, isn't this nice? I mean, if you don't have that, what was all the struggle about? Oh, that's so, yeah, I mean, that's so true for everyone. I think that kind of uh, most, I know so many people who have that false modesty and don't really just appreciate and recognize what they've accomplished. It's amazing. Look, one, the first time I got hip to this, I was coming out of a martial arts class. It was on a Saturday morning and all of us would go to, 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 to breakfast afterwards. And I'm in breakfast and there was another student who was there, who was a black belt in, in some other style. And I was complaining about my performance for a couple of minutes. And she finally looked at me and said, Steve, shut up. <laughs> if somebody at your level is not happy with your performance, what are the rest of us supposed to think? And I realized at that moment that I didn't have a right to be modest. I mean, I can think I'm no better than other people, but I have walked a different path. I genuinely have those skills. If I don't tell people I'm genuinely happy with what I've done in my career, I'm genuinely happy with who I became as a martial artist. I'm genuinely happy with the woman that I love, with the family that I've created. If I tell people that they can work for decades, and still not be happy and not be satisfied, not look at yourself in the mirror and think, yeah, I'm pretty cool. I mean, is it that much? I mean, at the end of life, you have to die. Who says that you don't get to be happy with yourself along the way? That false modesty of not wanting people to think that I think I'm better than they are is, un, is, is un, imbalanced, outweighed by the need for people to believe that they can be happy. That if they put in the work, they can transform themselves. They can actually create the lives they want. That there is a way for them to, to express their dreams. That the struggle is worth it. I have that responsibility. If I don't take that responsibility, I'm betraying the children of my tribe. I will not do that. So I have to stand up and say, yes, it is worth it. You can have the body that you want. You can have the love you want. You can have the career that you want. You can have all three things at the same time. It will be an uncommon life and it will require uncommon work, but it's right there for you. You can have it all. And I have, if I don't do that, I am a coward who is not speaking my truth because I'm afraid people are going to be pissed at me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's inspiring. That is inspiring. And and, and, and so true that that whole working on happiness and I was reading Viktor Frankl recently. Uh, fantastic. Fantastic. And, yeah, fantastic. And, and, and I guess I'll put that as it wasn't my best thing I learned this week, but it is the best thing I learned this week. And one of it's like, you can take any how, if you have a why, if you have a reason and a goal, then you can take any how. And I, I, I that's, that's oh my pretty God. powerful. Yeah, get me to go into that at some point. Yeah, what you just said is really true and really powerful. Okay, I think maybe we can talk about it a bit on our next segment. So for me, I guess I'll say Victor Franco with that, though I also want to add one more thing is that I found out the kids can fool at home COVID tests by using orange juice because the acidic gives you a false positive. So it's a way <laughs> to fool your parents and get out of school. That's I shouldn't say hilarious, but it kind of is because I, mean, I guess that's not the best thing, except if I was a kid, man, I would be just like orange juicing the hell out of those. <laughs> you, yeah. OK. Wow. And I, I mean, I was going to go into a whole science thing, but I'm going to save it because I think the best thing I learned this week was all the stuff I just learned from Steve. Yes. I mean, it was just so amazing, so inspiring. And, and I got to go back and listen to the area that I was off computer for. But wow, thank you. It was amazing. Well, that, all, that whole path that uh, 
lifewritingpremium.com is the course that I sell. It's a year long course that has weekly lessons and it covers that and a vast amount of other stuff. My good lady wife, Tanana Reed Du, you know, is a fantastic writer and a fantastic teacher. So we teach this stuff together. So you're getting the yin and the yang of it, both a, a masculine and a feminine perspective in balance. And we do think about these things a little differently in some ways that are fascinating. Really great. Oh, great. So thank you so much. Thank and you. we will see you in a bit. Yeah, thank That's you. Good. Okay.